We'll call the uh, uh, November 12th uh, meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council Ordinance Committee to order. All right. Uh, Council Member House. Here. Council Member Rouse. Here. And Council Member Hotchkiss. Here. Okay, very good. And Barbara, are you going to introduce our topic for the day? Yes, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, this draft ordinance would establish air quality design standards for new development near Highway 101. Um, the staff is recommending that the ordinance committee consider the draft ordinance and then forward it for planning commission to review and full city council adoption subsequently. Um, by way of background, the California Air Resources Board and our local Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District recommend that local agencies limit the development of land uses such as residential and schools in close proximity to highways to reduce health hazards associated with vehicle exhaust, uh, including diesel particulates. Um, the city looked at this issue as part of the 2011 general plan update. Uh, a report was undertaken to evaluate health risks along Highway 101 in Santa Barbara as part of the Program Environmental Impact Report, or EIR, for the general plan. And the EIR identified a policy to limit development of additional sensitive land uses within 250 feet of Highway 101 as a means of mitigating the air quality effects of infill development occurring along the highway to the year 2030 under the general plan. Um, this is probably hard to read, but it is the uh, policy ER7 as part of the 2011 general plan update. Uh, that was the policy adopted, and it directs that new development of residential and other sensitive land uses be prohibited within 250 feet of Highway 101 until the city determines that diesel emission risks are reduced along the freeway or that an individual project's particulate exposure risk is sufficiently reduced. Um, because there are uh, California Air Resources Board uh, regulations being phased in to reduce diesel particulate levels on highways statewide, it is anticipated that this would be a temporary city policy until pollution levels and health risks dis, uh, decrease. And then in 2012, the City Council adopted a resolution to implement the policy, which included establishing the applicable types of new development, and they directed staff to develop project review criteria as an implementing action. So to review the draft ordinance provisions, purpose and intent to protect the public health, safety and welfare, and to limit the number of additional people receiving extensive exposure to highway exhaust, including diesel particulates. A uh, few definitions of terms used in the ordinance. Sensitive individuals means persons most susceptible to health effects from poor air quality, including children, the elderly, and uh, those with uh, chronic illnesses. And then extensive exposure refers to daily occupancy or frank, uh, frequent lengthy visits over many years. And sensitive land uses uh, includes residences, retirement and nursing homes, schools, and large family daycare. Uh, and then where would the ordinance apply? So the location is New development for sensitive land uses on properties within 250 feet of Highway 101, and that's measured from the outside edge of the nearest travel lane, and it excludes on and off ramps. And there's an exception to that um, where there's a site location with a Caltrans highway sound wall because they reduce the exposure level to highway exhaust. And this is a map of um, the 250-foot setback and location of the Caltrans sound walls. And there's a copy of this in your packet. <coughs> um, and then when would the ordinance apply? The types of new development to which the ordinance provisions apply, and that's, again, consistent with the council's earlier resolution. And they are... Uh, Two or more new residential units on a vacant lot, 
one or more units on new units on a lot with existing development, uh, a substantial addition to an existing unit, so that would be greater than 50% floor area, a new building for sensitive land uses uh, such as nursing or retirement homes or schools, or a demolition and then replacement with a structure for sensitive land uses. So there are a number of types of projects that would be exempt, including project applications submitted or approved prior to December 2011, um, where those applications are still valid, uh, minor additions and remodels, and structures for commercial or other non-residential land uses. <clears throat> um, so the air quality design standards, um, new projects for these specified types of developments would be prohibited within 250 feet of Highway 101 unless the community development director or designee determines that the project design features address air quality, um, taking into account guidelines that identify methods for reducing exposure <coughs> to diesel particulates and other vehicle exhaust pollutants. And so the guidelines include uh, site layout measures, such as locating buildings and outdoor living areas for sensitive individuals as far as feasible from Highway 101, uh, providing vegetative screening or barriers such as fences and walls between the highway and the project, uh, in particular trees with leafy vegetation or needles help to reduce particulate concentrations. And then double-paned double windows and, and ventilation design. And there is a requirement for interior uh, ventilation and air filtration with a high-efficiency uh, high filter. <clears throat> the ordinance provisions would be implemented by planning staff as part of regular project application reviews and plan checks for building permits. Um, and then also the policy ER7, on which this ordinance is based, is identified as an interim policy until such time as air pollution levels and hazards are reduced. So staff will also be tracking state regulatory efforts to reduce statewide diesel particulates and other pollutants. Um, recent studies have indicated there's been a substantial reduction in diesel, diesel particulates over the past decade. Um, the um, updated measurement or modeling of air quality conditions along Highway 101 within the city will be conducted periodically as part of the general plan adaptive management program after which the policy EIR7 and these ordinance provisions would be reassessed. The draft ordinance includes a sunset clause uh, indicating that the ordinance would be repealed when council determines that health risks along 101 have fallen uh, below the standard criterion. <clears throat> then the ordinance adoption process, um, just to go back a step, as part of the general plan update process, there was extensive public review prior to council adoption of air quality policy ER7, and that included noticing of all the property owners, uh, the environmental impact report analysis, public works workshop discussions, as well as public hearings at the Planning Commission, the Council Subcommittee, and the full uh, City Council. For this implementing ordinance, the review and adoption process would include this ordinance committee review and then a Planning Commission hearing for review and re recommendation, and finally a full City Council hearing to consider ordinance adoption. That brings us back to... Uh, staff recommendations to consider the draft ordinance and forward it for planning commission review and city council adoption. So Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation. Okay, we'll just take uh, questions right now. Um, any qu direct questions from staff for staff? We'll do that in a moment. Let's do some questions first, uh, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so Ms. Weiss, do we have a, an idea of the non-sound wall properties at border the freeway in terms of what the inventory is, vacant or otherwise, developed or otherwise, um, types of use, that type of thing, and of course, obviously, parcel owners that, that may be affected by such an ordinance. Ms. Weiss? Yes, we, we do have a parcel database uh, related to this project. Um, it did, uh, we were 
reported in the general plan process where um, people were considering, the council was still considering 500 feet or 250 feet, um, and that was uh, more than 300 parcels affected. But when it came down to the 250 feet, that was reduced. And then with this proposal and the sound walls, which is a, a new addition to, the, to this ordinance, um, the number of parcels we estimate at about 90 parcels involved. Um, I don't have an inventory of uh, uh, the parcels being vacant or not. Um, we could compare it to our vacant parcel database. I haven't done that. But my general um, opinion on that is that there are probably very few vacant parcels within this area, although I'm sure there are some. Um, vacant is uh, defined as not having a... A, a regular structure, four walls and a roof, um, uh, for which a building permit or, was required. So um, most of these properties, I believe, are already developed. And so, and of course, once again, you're talking about either uh, significant or, or, or minor alterations. Would the standard code would be the 50 percent of floor or, or floor area ratio, right? Right. So if existing land uses and buildings. Um, that are residential under this ordinance wanted to do a substantial remodel and not even add the ordinance wouldn't apply that's exempt but additions up to 50 percent of the floor area is what's proposed more than 50 percent is when it becomes triggered again when you think of this this swath of the highway and all the land uses along here um, there definitely are segments that are commercial um, or semi-industrial, and the ordinance doesn't apply to those unless a new specific land use, such as a large family daycare or something, were to go in there. Uh, mixed use, however, it, it, would, it would apply to a mixed use development because residential is pre present. Well, I was thinking about the developable vacant land and, and how this would affect, I mean, it's not a taking exactly because you can build certain things with certain types of modifications and standards to mitigate what we consider the, the current status of particulates and pollution along the corridor? We'll, we'll follow up and get you this, the exact information on vacant land. Again, I think it's a fairly small amount of, right. if there are. Um, as well, um, uh, residential uses aren't allowed in the M1, so as this goes through the M1 area, if there's a vacant parcel in M1, that wouldn't necessarily be a concern. But on a vacant land, since the beginning with your council resolution, we established that one new residential unit on a vacant piece of land is permitted. So, yes. I think it would be, I think exactly that would be very handy to have the zoning overlays as they currently sit uh, when we do the council presentation. Thank you. I, I don't see any speaker slips right now. Um, do we have anyone wishing to speak? Okay, good. So we'll open and close public um, comment on that. And uh, just a question I had, um, and then we'll go to Mr. Hotchkiss. Um, with regards to what the standard is that we're, that we're holding to, and I think it was, it's actually identified in the draft ordinance at the very, very end on page 4, um, this ordinance shall be repealed when the City Council determines that the health risk posed from toxic air contaminants due to extensive occupancy and proximity to Highway 101 falls below a cancer health risk of 10 cases per 1 million persons. So uh, I, I can imagine in a 12-lane or a 16-lane freeway, and so, you know, right next to it, there would be an awful lot more of the environmentally harmful diesel particulates or whatever they are in the air than we would have here even on our busiest days. Are there ways to actually measure the, um, the air pollution adjacent to a freeway that can be employed or used so we would know what the actual conditions are in here and know whether we were below or above this threshold? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, it's, it's something that's... Um starting to be done more uh, throughout the state because of this issue. Um, right now, we, we do have monitoring in Santa Barbara, but it's not right next to the freeway. So it, and they also don't really look at that, um, like the diesel um, ele element of the pollution. Um, this, I know in Los Angeles recently, they 
uh, put in some new monitoring um, locations right along the freeway, partly because um, they're not sure that without them they would be able to meet their federal EPA uh, air quality guidelines. But we did, we were able to use um, information from the state in doing this city study and then modeling it based on a lot of inputs of um, the amount of traffic, the amount of truck traffic, um, the, the air, the air uh, district provides um, uh, criteria for how much diesel particulates is by truck, by the numbers of trucks and types of trucks. So, um, you know, over time we would expect to be able to do that type of modeling effort and come up with um, uh, analysis of the situation, um, but it would be helpful over time if we were able to come up with a way or funding somehow to provide additional um, monitoring. I see. Okay. Um, it, it, was there something else, sir, Ms. Wiz, on that? Or just it seems to me like um, perhaps maybe a property owner that wanted to develop their property could. Um, set up a monitoring station on their property and be able to demonstrate that the that it's that they either have a really serious problem they're going to have to mitigate for it in terms of the design or maybe not even build or on the other hand that they could show that there were that there were was a threshold that wasn't being met you know that they were actually below that uh, that level so I mean how does that play out if somebody wanted I mean I had somebody communicate with me I don't know if you did uh, uh, you guys but um, who said it should be a thousand feet. You know, and then we had 500 and we have 250. On what specific criteria, where's the actual measurement that we'll be using to assist the city council in making that kind of declaration or any particular property owner in saying, we really don't have a problem here if they don't? There, there was extensive analysis included in the environmental impact report upon which this policy was based. Mm -hmm. And as Ms. Shelton said, uh, we had a lot of information about the volume of traffic and the type of vehicles on the section of Highway 101 through the city. Uh, there was also information from the Air Pollution Control District and other studies that the uh, modeler was able to use. Um, and we want to still rely on that kind of information, which we think was a reasonable worst-case scenario, not an extreme best case or worst case. Some communities throughout the state do uh, require actually individual property owners to do additional study, but uh, it's usually more of a modeling study versus an actual um, monitoring. It's very difficult to get appropriate sampling. Um, it, it could be very expensive. What we learned from the Air Pollution Control District is um, that it's very hard to determine what the air pollution concern is related to diesel particulates, uh, climate conditions, other kind of particulate and uh, exhaust um, air quality concerns. So you can't really parse it out very easily with a simple monitoring uh, program. The consultation we had with the Air Pollution Control District um, early on, they felt that our approach of... Um, taking these what you could call guidelines or best management steps and applying them as, as best we can to limit the exposure is probably the best way to go. Uh, we are, I think the ordinance, does it provide a provision that Ms. Shelton will read you where we will certainly accept additional information okay. in determining what the best, uh, what the need is and what the best solution is. But we think just saying up front we'd like the project to incorporate and consider these steps first is a, a very good approach, we believe, and so does the local air pollution district. But the, co the ordinance would allow for... Michelle. Yes, um, it is, as, as Ms. Weiss said, um, there are a number of jurisdictions around the state that actually do require every project to pay for a health risk assessment as a part of this type of thing. But rather than taking that approach, we wanted to just try and move towards um, um, the measures that you would take to reduce the risk. Um, however, we included 
in um, the ordinance, it's page three under the uh, item B exemptions number four that um, would allow an individual um, project proponent or property owner to decide that they wanted to take this other approach and try and provide analysis. So it basically says projects where the developer can demonstrate to the satisfaction of community development director or the director's designee that the site-specific climatic or topographic conditions avoid or address the air quality risks from Highway 101 on the site. Okay, very good. Uh, so then on that, just the last little piece in that, that section three at the very, very end where it mentions the 10 cases per 1 million persons, that didn't just come out of thin air. Somebody got that from CARB or someplace and mm -hmm. used that. There must be measurements that can be employed by a city council in the future if they wanted to lift this, um, you know, because this is supposed to be temporary, it says. Um, do we know what those measurements would be? I mean, are there actual... Is there an actual way to test our stretch of the freeway and, and to know whether it was safe for us to, to lift these requirements? Well, again, that's where we would have to... I mean, in coming up with the 250 feet or the 500 feet, those, all those studies, the state study that came up with, with the you know, earlier guideline and then the city study that came up with the 250 feet, that was based on using that criteria and then um, converting it to essentially air quality constituent con concentrations. Um, and so we would be able to do a, a similar type of modeling study or if better uh, monitoring of actual air quality in information, if we find a way to, to get that or if the state st or the air district starts providing better uh, information on that, would be able to plug that in as well. But even without that, we would be able to use um, the the information that we do have and and the um, modeling mm -hmm. approach to to do this, okay. um, as I said, the, the some recent studies have come out from the California Air Resources Board indicating that in fact um, uh, their regulatory approach for um, diesel fuel diesel engines retrofitting of diesel engines. All of those different steps they've been taking over the past several years have been having a real effect, and they, they think that um, diesel particulate uh, levels have been reduced. Um, and I am trying to um, work with our local APCD, and I've talked with the um, state ARB as well in trying to come up with better data about exactly what are the conditions in our local area. Okay. Um, and, that, and we would continue to do that and, and um, provide um, periodic uh, information to council as part of the adaptive management program. Okay. Very clear. Uh, Mr. Hotchkiss, uh, you had your light on for a minute. Well, maybe I'm missing it here, but I think we're sort of saying there's a line in the sand. We just don't know where it is. Mr. Chair. Well, okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Hotchkiss. Uh, the line in the sand in this section three that we're sp specifically talking about as to when this ordinance might be repealed, there is a line in the sand of the 10 cases, the, it's, it, the health risk set at 10 cases per 1 million persons. So that is a definitive line in the sand that it, it's a measurable health risk. This section has been intentionally left open as to what evidence the city might use to establish on what side we are on that threshold. We might have site-specific, city-specific measurements in the future. We don't really have that information today, and we don't have a real expectation of having that information in the near future. However, we don't want to ignore if there are studies elsewhere within the state that show that new state standards, as they are implemented by the Air Resources Board, that become effective in reducing the the health risks associated with freeways. We don't want to be in a position where we, we have to ignore that circumstance if it's measured in Los Angeles. If we could use, make that information useful in evaluating our health risk here in Santa Barbara. So it, we're not tied to a particular methodology of reaching this conclusion, but we do want to have a, a demonstrable standard of the 10 cases per 1 million persons as this is where it, it needs to get to this level before we're, we're comfortable in repealing this ordinance 
then we know that, that the public is still safe. Right, but it needs to get to this level according to CARB? No, it needs to get to that level according to the city council. Now, depend, and it's a matter of the future city councils will have to be convinced based on the evidence that's presented to them that we've reached this level of a health risk or below that level of a health risk. It's not clear to me how we're ever going to do that if we don't know how we're getting to it now. Um, different question. Chair. Sure. House yes, please, Ms. Weiss. Yeah. Council Member um, Hotchkiss. We, we do know how we could get to that determination. Okay. The same way we've already determined that within 250 feet, there is the potential to be at the 10 persons per million or greater. So we've already done a study that showed that we didn't think the hazard was at a 500-foot distance, but it could occur. We did a, a study that showed... City of Santa Barbara residents within 250 feet, with this level of exposure, we could incur 10 persons per million, you know, that fraction. We don't have a 10 million population or a million population here, but we, we would employ similar studies as well as additional better information as it becomes available to be able to inform the council when we think the city um, highway and the, the living conditions are below this level. We will be able to do that. Okay, so if there are studies somewhere in California that the state acknowledges that indicate there have been such improvements in diesel engines, et cetera, that the health risk is less than 10, then we would adopt that and say, okay, we're cool. Correct? Yes, it's, it's in real simple terms. There's more to it than this, but... The state puts out information that says if a highway carries this level of traffic and this kind of breakdown of so right. many trucks and so many cars, it results in this level of hazard. Right. With all the reductions in the exhaust formula, that, that, um, that curve lowered. Sure. And as it lowers and we look at the volumes of traffic we have, we'll be able to see when we're below that threshold. Okay, I understand. At one point in the beginning of your presentation, Ms. Shelton, you said, use the word prohibit. And then later we said, well, we're not really saying prohibit. You just have to adopt new standards. Am I correct? Ms. Shelton? Yes. Um, I wanted to just find the... Um... This is one of the first slides that you had. It was earlier. Well, there was... Hmm. Set, go back and just <laughs> prohibit it. There you go. First line. Right. Well, that basically that word, I was looking for the one that had the... Um, sorry. There it is. Okay. Um, this was the original ER7 um, policy. So that's the, the adopted general plan policy that's currently in place. And... Um, so this is the language that, was, that is in this policy um, right now, that, um, that this type of development would be prohibited. Um, and then it says, until the city determines that diesel emission risks can be satisfactorily reduced or that a project's particular exposure level is sufficiently reduced. Right, so, so I, I'm just trying to take the fear out of people that live in this... 250 foot, or really 500 foot corridor on either side, 250 on either side, that there are ways to develop your property. Um, it's not prohibited, but you're, you're, the standards required are going to be different than if, they, if it wasn't the case. Is that right? Is that fair to say that? Yes, I think it, we're saying that it's prohibited unless you can um, provide some design yeah. guidance. Uh, through these guidance um, guidelines, filtering systems, whatever. Yeah. yeah. In fact, the um, in interior air filtering um, is has been shown to be one of the most effective ways of of dealing with this. I so a central so. Yeah. system like that. Okay. So I just again, I wanted people not to hear that word prohibit and stop listening. So we have there are ways to develop. Okay. Thank you. Uh, quick question, sort of along that lines. We you know we require. <laughs> Outdoor living space as part of our proposals, um, they have to come through with that. Um, how would that affect anything in the outdoors? You can't put a filtration system outdoors. Does it? Is that anticipated to be a um, mm -hmm. a major barrier to development in that area? 
no, I, I mean, clearly we have an area that's largely developed, and so we're talking about infill development here. Um, and some of these parcels are somewhat constrained. So the approach we're taking is to look at each, you know, as there's a project that comes in and we review it and look at what are out of this sort of list of different uh, approaches for reducing the risk, what are the ones that might be feasible on this particular lot? Um, possibly if you're designing and doing the layout for a project, maybe you could put the outdoor living area farther away from the freeway than maybe something like a parking area that where you're not going to spend as much time. Um, so it's that type of approach where we try and just look at this issue and identify what are the feasible measures that can be applied for a particular lot and a particular parcel. Okay. And there's uh, some more detailed guidance inside the ordinance that talks about the, how thick, the, even how thick the foliage might be. The idea of the multi layers and and uh, and then the idea of a sound wall. I guess somebody could propose if they're going to if they had the money to do it, they could put up a wall that would be a sound wall on their own property. Is that would that also be possible? Um, yes, there is an overlap between the city's noise policies right. and this issue where we do have experience with applicants designing um, somewhat sheltered patio areas. Uh, certainly not all the open space is sheltered, but with the orientation of the buildings or walls within a project, they can establish that outdoor areas or at least the required 200 square foot area or something like that is um, sheltered from noise and then would also be sheltered from um, particulates. So until during this interim policy, we're going to have, if there is development, it's going to be built to effectively a higher standard that will protect the residents from whatever there might be until we finally are sure that it's going to be safe. Yeah? Okay, well then, I suppose I'll entertain a motion at this point. I'd like to make the motion, if I could, sir, please, that we forward the draft ordinance to the Planning Commission review and subsequent City Council adoption. Okay, very good. Second? Well, I'll second that. Any comments or any direction or suggestions yes, you want uh, to send well, along? Well, actually, with? one more question. So, okay. uh, once again, probably for Ms. Weiss, on the, uh, the, the 101 corridor uh, to the south of the corridor where the railroad uh, runs along the freeway, I guess after the uh, Castillo exit, uh, what is the distance between the last traffic lane and then you've got, of course, the railroad easement and then you get finally to where a private property lines would start is that's that's got to be pretty close to the the specified uh, barriers and I, I don't know I'm just kind of off the top of my head yes I agree there are certain segments where the Caltrans right-of-way and then the adjoining railroad um, so say imagine on the um, like state and Las Positas on the west side where the railroad runs mm -hmm. runs right along there and then you get to um, you know where the Greenwell project is? Okay. They, we've worked with a property owner in that area, um, Burnworth, Bruce Burnworth, uh, because he owned property right there, and he needed, again, to do um, sound walls and all kinds of things. Well, his property went all the way to the railroad right-of-way. But other properties... Um, and it was unusual that he had a, a larger piece that wasn't fully developed. But most of the properties there, they're, they're probably um, just one row of parcels that could be affected, if that. Um, but I do know that we did measure, he measured from the railroad, I mean from the edge of the travel lane, and even accounting for the railroad, the line did, um, I think, did touch his property. Is that correct? Yes, although that particular project went through before the policy was in place, but he, he did a bunch still of things, in yeah. incorporated the, basically this whole list of, um, of measures, including interior filtration, um, vegetative screening, and the layout of the buildings and venting systems and so forth. What is it, my concerns are probably the same, Mr. Hotchkiss, as we present this to the public and come from council chambers, and you have this arbitrary 250 feet on the other side of the freeway going through, and of course they're all not. If you put monitoring stations, you know there'd be there'd be all you get very different readings. I think from prevailing winds and currents in different areas that are there. So, uh, but 
I think we'd have to be able to also point out that between the sound walls and vegetative screen, there are mitigations. It's not going to be a, like a taking. We're going to be able to, to work with people in terms of their parcels. and. That's correct. And I think there is also the point that um, while there are, are variations of wind currents and topography and those types of things, the idea here is that um, it's not going to be like that all the time. And so you really wa do want to look at properties that are that close to the freeway and, um, and try and incorporate these best management uh, design measures. Thank you. Okay, and, and we will get more detailed information to help uh, land use <laughs> survey and, and identify the number of vacant parcels and such at our next step. Uh, that, that was my, my comment. Was whatever more you can add to the data mix, especially, I think, with regards to the criteria. Um, for the person that thinks it should be 1,000 feet, which I think they're very earnest in their concerns, uh, they need to know the date, that the data doesn't support the, that need. And, um, and if it's going to be 250, we need to be pretty sure that within that 250 there is a need and we're going to get better development because of it. Uh, Mr. Hotchkiss, was there something else? Uh, I just thought of something. Is this going to require a some sort of disclosure upon sale or purchase of a home within this 250 square feet or feet, linear feet? Mr. Vincent. Mr. Chair. Um, oh, the, Ms. oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that that is something that's done in a number of jurisdictions. For example, in um, the county of Santa Barbara's Los Alamos community plan, they have a measure that requires um, that. Uh, a notification be provided and uh, um, we considered that issue and um, felt like it wasn't really um, particularly with a temporary type of thing it probably was not the best way to go um, obviously there are a number of existing <coughs> um, properties that have development and they don't have that on uh, a recorded notice and so forth so um, it's, it's something that is done in some locations, but we haven't proposed it as part of the ordinance at this point. So the Association of Realtors could make that voluntarily if they wanted to, uh, just to protect themselves? I guess they could. Yeah, their yeah. choice. Okay, thank you. Well, um, will this show up on zoning maps, or will this, where will this show up? I mean, it seems like if somebody were looking into a file on a given address, We've will already this be yeah. indicated somewhere? Yes, we've already included a parcel tag on our computerized database so that uh, if a project comes in, um, it's, it's immediately um, noticed that it's um, within that distance. Okay, anything else? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you.
Make a passion undone.